We are thrilled to welcome Michael Gervais to the podcast today. Dr. Gervais is one of the world's top high-performance psychologists and leading experts on the relationship between the mind and human performance. He has spent his career helping the best of the best across the worlds of business, sports, the arts, and science when they need to achieve the extraordinary. His clients include world record holders, Olympians, internationally acclaimed artists and musicians, MVPs from every major sport, and Fortune 100 CEOs. He is the founder of Finding Mastery, a high-performance psychology consulting agency that helps individuals and innovative companies solve the most dynamic human performance challenges through mindset training. Dr. Gervais is also the host of the Finding Mastery podcast and the co-creator of the Performance Science Institute at USC. Straight up, everyone, you're going to hear me just gush about this incredible human being. The further along I get in my coaching career, where I'm asked to come in and help untangle complex problems of high performance, we just see a con or continue to see a dearth of mindset, frameworks. People just have zero training here. It's shocking. Yeah. And one of the things I loved about this is that on this podcast, we have had a lot of people who have spoken to the physical. You know, we've had nutritionists and coaches of all stripes and athletes, and we haven't had as many um, experts come in and talk to us about, you know, this mindset piece, piece, which is so important in high performance, anything, whether it's athletics or business or whatever anyone's trying to do well. There's a, a nuance here I want to just quickly discuss in that sometimes people hear sports psychology and that's like, mm, how do I get better at making this shot or doing this thing or taking the moment? But high performance means how do we take the principles underlying really the best humans doing the hardest work and apply them backwards to our families, to our businesses. And that is Mike's special, special superpower. He has done a wonderful job of translating these high performance sort of high risk situations into how you and I might be better parents or how we might prepare our kids to be able to handle the pressures of sport and school. Yeah. And I also love talking to him about his new book called The First Rule of Mastery, which you and I both loved and learned a ton from. And overall, I just thought it was a really wide ranging and super interesting conversation. He is a full ninja. I can't wait for you to enjoy this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Michael Gervais. Michael, welcome to the Ready State Podcast. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with you guys. Thanks for thanks for including me. Well, and I just like to start by saying it really is thanks for including me because mm -hmm. you and Kelly have a bromance. Is that the right word? Uh, even if it's, it's one way and perceived, Kelly has I'll a take bromance it. with you. Um, you may I may have just revealed this to you. So I I probably just going to be a bit of a sideshow in this conversation as you guys talk about your love for one another and your respective work. But um, but let's get started. Welcome. Thanks oh, for nice. being here. So yeah, let me set you. the stage for everyone a little bit. Um, Juliet and I have been working in, well, in and around high performance and in fields and around people whose performance matters. They have something at stake. And what I'll say is certainly we came in through musculoskeletal health and sort of environmental health, but sort of what I always felt like was a blind spot of mine or potentially an opportunity to seek other health was was talking about the mind and talking about the brain. And I've always been looking for those resources. And I don't know if it's because it didn't resonate with me or it's particularly because I was like, I needed it the most that I, you know, was, I Definitely didn't. Definitely the latter. Thank you. <laughs> but that's how I really discovered your work and, you know, have been such a consumer, everyone, of, of the work that you've done, Mike. Oh, fun. Well, that, that makes it easy. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's how I started as well, which is like, I needed it. I, as a young athlete, I, I had physical skills, technical skills, but come game day, I didn't, I couldn't get free. I just couldn't get into that place that was like that slipstream of feeling like it all was connecting and come to find out. And I can tell you lots of stories about how it happened, but come to find out, like, I didn't have the mental tools. I just like, I invested physically and technically. And I, I had like a good base there for, for a high school kid, be clear. And, um, and, and now like, uh, or, and then at that point, someone introduced it like, Hey, you know, the reason you kind of are choking game day is because like 
you're thinking differently. I said, how'd you know? He said, well, it's obvious because I play with you all the time. It was surfing. And so as I, I, I surf with you all the time. And um, the things that you can do on non-competition day are ridiculous. What happens, you know, when it's competitions is like, it's a joke and com compared to what you're capable of doing. So that's how it started for me, like an embarrassing experience over and over again of just being up in my head and not knowing how to get free. So I'm glad, glad there's some similarities in our story there. Yeah. So it sounds like your athletic background was in surfing and you were high school competitive surfer. Did you go on farther in your surfing career and were there other sports at play here? Well, you know, the science between imagination and reality blur between <laughs> those lines blur just a bit. You know, I'm in the science of, of visualization. So in my mind, yes, World class. it worked out really well. Yeah. It worked out really well for a long time. <laughs> but um, in reality, uh, no, I went to college and kind of hung it up right after high school. But uh, where was the point at which you decided that this was the path you wanted to take and made that connection between you know, realizing, and you said you had some stories to tell around this, but sort of realizing that you hadn't been able to make that leap into competition and, and, you know, you didn't, you were lacking the tools. I think it was the word you used to sort of, you know, show up on competition days and perform well, That's where, right. where did that transition happen for you? Well, I, I did not have the track record in competition that I needed to progress forward. So it was, it was forced on me. If I would have had the tools um, and I could surf the way it's those two types of surfing, free surfing and competitive surfing. If I could have surfed the way I surfed in free surfing, which was, you know, that culture is all about being hardcore and putting yourself in a consequential situation. Don't talk about it. Don't even mention it to anybody, but know it, know that you made the micro choice to put yourself in the pit, in the, in the, in, in that space. And, and then competition was all about show. And so if I could do the things that I could do when no one was watching, when people were watching, the path would have been different, but um, it wasn't. And so that's just like the, the, the hard truth of looking back at my younger years. If I would have just had this stuff that hopefully we get to talk about, that it maybe would have been different. And I'm not mad about it. You know, like a, it's, I really like my life. Way leads to way, right? Out. Thank goodness that that young kid Thank choked a couple times. I'm for the rest of us. <laughs> right. Yeah. For me too. <laughs> you know, and, and then I would say um, the second forcing function was, uh, I mean, it's like it was yesterday. My mom pulled me into our living room. I'm sorry, into our, um, uh, into our breakfast area, like our kitchen. And, and she says, it was my senior year in high school. And she said, you know, Mike, we tried, we tried our best. Your father and I, we didn't go to college. We didn't know how to navigate. You know, you got a zero on your PSAT because you went surfing. You got a zero on your SAT because you went surfing. You, you now have a choice. And I was like, wow, like this sounds serious. And she's, she's looking at me like, yeah, you've got to make a choice. Uh, either get a job and move out or go to community college. And instantly I thought that if I made the choice to go to community college, I know how to do that game where I'm pretending like I'm going to school, but I'm really surfing. And so I said, well, let's just extend the game, you know, a couple more years and it'll buy me some time to figure out what next. And I landed at a community college, which I thought was for losers. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, but I, I had no other choices. I had zero choices. And so um, I showed up and it was my second semester. I'm sorry, my first semester. And these three professors looked at me and they're like, hey, kid, um, you got a little interesting spark about you. Like, we'd love to show you kind of how psychology and um, philosophy and uh, um, uh, theology work together. And they happen to be best friends. There are three professors. It sounds like it was a bad joke being set up, but it was a, a, a theologian, a psychologist and a philosopher. And I, by the second semester I was in, in my first year of school at a community college, I was like, holy shit, this is awesome. And so at that point I started becoming more interested in how to take these insights and ways of thinking from psychology and, and philosophy and then fuse them into surfing for me. So it was all very, very selfish and self-oriented. And I think if I would have had that stuff earlier, things would have clicked, but that wasn't my path. And that led me down to a very different path to our point, which I got to study it for the rest of you know my adult life now. How does 
how does uh, the world of the invisible work? And that's been where I've been the last 20, 30 years. That's amazing. When you were in high school and you said you had this experience that was sort of you were rate limited and being able to access the, the feelings of being just free, mm-hmm. were you presented with any choices then? Did you, someone said, hey, you could work with someone, a coach, about no. your mindset and prep, or, or was that just too long ago in the dark ages of, of sports yeah, it, for it, us? Yeah, well, so this was, so surfing was way behind, still is. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's caught up actually in quite interesting ways, but um, no, that was like, suck it up and put yourself in a heavy situation and you'll figure it out, you know, and no one really drowns. So like, just keep pushing. And what are you afraid? You know, keep stepping over the ledge, come on. And so it was just that, it was that mentality and there was zero sophistication. There's no technical physical coaches. I was eating a half a dozen donuts before I'd surf every morning. That was- okay. Because you could. Just, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I was a skinny fat, you know, like un- unfit, but wiry. And um, um, so, yeah, there was no sophistication at that point. This was in um, late eighties. You end up at, this this college and you're synthesizing integrating these three people have figured out some truth and you immediately as a stakeholder realize that hey you can get something in here which is a wonderful way to get people to care yeah i mean what a way in right right like even if it was to improve your own surfing i mean that's what a way in we have done that so many times like hey you're interested in something your pain or your because it's preventing you from doing something yeah um but at that time, was there even a language around the performance of the brain and the mind? I, I'm trying to remind, remember coming back and I don't, I have zero, it's like a ghost, a penumbra of experience where there is no conversation as a young kid in the 80s and 90s talking about these things. And I'm mar- and just for reference, everyone, I'm married to the greatest gamer baller on the planet like oh mm-hmm. big moment shows up juliet shows up like if it's not a big moment she's probably just an a but like as soon as there's pressure like she, you're a diamond it's crazy. i have zero physical skills and mm. um but i am a gamer but you know i was gonna mm. say two quick stories when i was a d1 rower at cal i would do wake up at 5 30 and do like a two and a half hour practice and then i would eat a plain bagel and a mocha as my after fat-free, practice, baby. fat-free mocha. Um, so I'm just telling you, I relate to the donut thing. I literally, like, I look back and I think, wow, I could have been so much better. But yeah, I mean, I think Kelly's right. Like, I actually had, I guess, now that I'm thinking about it, a sort of forward-thinking high school rowing coach who did have us do some visualizations, but that was it. I mean, visualizing was the yeah, we soul. visualized the course we were just memorizing. Yeah, I mean, we, we visualized like how hard we were going to suffer in the eight minutes we were going to row or whatever. But I mean, honestly, like that's it. Good luck. Like, that's all we did mm-hmm. in the late eighties and probably until yeah, pretty and, recently. And I think the, yeah, ditto and even less than that, but I think really good coaches. So I wasn't afforded a coach like surfing didn't have coaching at that point. So, and I didn't fit in, in traditional stick and ball sports where there were coaches. I didn't get, adults screaming at kids and I didn't get artificially created rules. Like what, what, what do you mean? It has to stay in these lines. Like, like if you can score in a different way, like what, so I didn't get it. So I liked mother nature, nature as a teacher, as opposed to mm. screaming adults that didn't quite um, have their shit together. So why am I listening to this? So that was me being a, a bit of a punk, you know, as a young age. And all that being said is that, um, that I think the really great coaches, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even like the really great coaches had uh, inherent or um, somehow they had good psychological um, mechanisms to pass through to their to their athletes. Like John Wooden was in right. all intents and purposes, like a legend, not because of his technical and physical development, but because of the way he shaped culture and he helped shape the thinking around what it means to be successful. And so the great ones were on it. They were on that path. And the discipline, the science of sports psychology early days was simply let's study the great coaches and let's study the great athletes and let's figure out what the great ones are doing and see if we can formulate um, best practices and then share those with folks that are not exposed to it. So that's the origin story. 
Do you think they were meta aware of the process of what they're doing or was it coaching? So the, the question is, were they, were they conscious of the sort of this performance mindset, things that they were, the constraints, the, the shaping of the, the mind to play sport or do anything. And second, did they inherit that? Do you think from another coach or they stumbled on this thing that led to performance and they just, it sort of fed itself. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's yes to all of that. I think that um, when you go into an elite sporting environment and you ask anyone, you know, Julia, maybe one of your coaches or, you know, anyone in modern times, you say, how important is the mental part of the game? <laughs> and, and they, they, they nod like athletes and coaches like, oh, at this level. Yeah. And so they understand the value of it and they've invested in trying to figure out how to translate, you know, how to be better in, in whether it's life or whether it's on the pitch or whatever it might be, they're invested in that. And so, uh, coaching trees are really interesting because they're like shared practices and shared philosophies. And then you try to take those things that you learn from your mentor and make it yours, but you don't deviate too far from it because you've seen success, you know, from your mentors. So that is a bit of the traditions of coaching right now underfoot meeting evidence-based best practices. And so, you know, I think the best type of program, whether it's in high school or it's in um, elite sport, is a blending between the traditions of the culture and, um, and best practices according to science. So that was going to be, I, I'm hoping you could just expand a little bit on that because that was going to be my question. I mean, if, if the sports, you know, the sort of profession or thinking around sports psychology started off as like, let's look at the best coaches and athletes and see what they're doing and do that. And then presumably since then, the profession has evolved to, you know, have very serious studies and, and people are now taking an evidence-based approach. Um, I, I guess my question is like, what's working? Like, what are the tools that are working um, to help athletes perform better? Like, is it a simple set of things? Is it complicated based on the athlete? Like, where are we now in terms of this sort of hybrid, you know, tradition slash evidence base and like what tools are working in this field? Okay, that's a cool. Yeah, cool question. Because if let's, let's give some context and maybe put like a spectrum. And, you know, if there was a wide spectrum, it would be from a dysfunctional person to a functional or a, someone who's suffering to someone who's thriving. We could put lots of labels to low performance to high performance. You could put some labels just to create the spectrum. And so in psychology, there's classically uh, clinically trained professionals that understand the science that supports traditional psychology, and then they can specialize in sport performance environments. So those folks can look at one of two or a, a, the entire human. When I say one or two, I mean, I'd strike that actually. Those folks can see and look and work with the entire human. So they can work with like anxiety, depression, addictions, you fill in the blank. And if you think about that kind of below the line type of struggling or suffering, and then above the line is like the things that help enhance a sense of self or enhance performance. So above the line, below the line, or spectrum left to right is a way to think about it. And, and then when you drill down one step underneath each one of those, um, uh, uh, counterbalance weights is that underneath like well-being, there's a whole set of practices that sit there. And then underneath high performance, there's a whole set of practices that sit there. I'm most interested, and I'm going to be very concrete in my answer to Juliet, but I'm most interested in the intersection between well-being and high performance. Like what are those, what's that Venn diagram where I get like a two for? And so those practices are uh, simple and, but humans are complex. So the complexity of the human experience doesn't actually um, equate to the translation of simple practices, but I'll, I'll give you the simplicity of them right now. Mental imagery, a thousand percent, triple down on it. Yes. And there is some structure on how to make it more simple, but it's seeing a compelling future, seeing yourself in it, seeing and feeling yourself navigating challenges. And doing that somewhere between, oh, I don't know, let's say three minutes to 12 minutes, like closing your eyes, feeling a future that's compelling and wonderful. Um, Hicks and Gracie, one of the greatest street fighters of all time, when I'm talking to him about it, uh, he says, oh, the way I use my imagination, 
He says, it's like the most beautiful movie you could imagine and I'm starring in it. I love it. So that's kind of what mental imagery is about. So check the box mental imagery, check the box for meditation and mindfulness, check the box for being um, very explicit with how you want to speak to yourself, your self-talk. Check the box on breathing practices as um, many of your community members are, I'm sure are very aware. Um, check the box on goal setting, uh, pre-performance routines. And I think I'm missing one, but like they're very concrete tools when you practice them, just like anything else, when you practice any skill, you can get better at it. And so that doesn't begin to answer the complexity of the human that's showing up on the pitch. That's a whole different thing. So I just gave you four or five skills as opposed to a whole set of practices to be more you, to have this sense, this feeling that you can be completely where your body is, no matter the circumstances, you can be at home with yourself wherever you are. That takes time. The skills take time. But when you put the two together, you've got something that's exponentially, like ridiculously powerful. Do you think that there's an age where we we can formally start to layer this in? So, you know, I have this one daughter who's freshman at Michigan. I'm like, it's too late. I've already lost her. Like I probably messed it up. Good luck. Whatever <laughs> meager tools we kicked you out into the world with kid, you're on your own. But I have this, this sophomore, I have a few more years in, you know, I just wonder sometimes as parents, and this will be, I will evolve this question, but as parents thinking about for sort of first priority organism organization, that's my home. That's my, that's my functional unit of the, the household. Do you, is there a place for some of this? And of course I'm being tongue in cheek here, but I sometimes think that this is never talked about the routines, the practice, the repetition, the, you know, just the mindfulness or, or just the, the visualization for, you said three minutes and I was like, who can't just picture themselves daydreaming in the future world for three minutes? I mean, yeah, but it, it yeah. seems like that's the first order of business is to try to take some of these very high performance principles and put them early so that they're baked into, this is what my family does and this is what we've always done. That's a, yeah. So that's okay. So we're seeing a couple things that are taking place over the, let's say the last seven years, maybe, maybe a little bit longer is that, the um, more people have checked nihilism on um, versus, you know, uh, Christianity or Muslim or like there is a there's an there's a there's a calling to say, I don't know what I'm believing in, huh. but I'm not believing in the institutions uh, of religion that traditionally taught me like there's a shift that's changing. And so what religions formal, there's 11 formal you know religions and what all of them do is have a set of practices for you to live the good life according to their philosophy, right? And so like, if you just take Judaism and Christianity or even put um, Islamic in there as well, is that in the Christian faith, like pray before meals, you know, you do a certain set of practices on Sunday and Saturday. And like, there's practices that are woven in through your day. Mm -hmm. As those institutions become um, questioned and for good reason, like if, I grew up in a very Christian approach. My family's still deeply engaged in it. And every time I say this out loud, I feel like I am uh, turning my back on my family uh, spiritual life. And like we were very studied in, in the doctrines. That being said, like if any other institution hid child abusers of sex and abuse and, other, and hid them, that institution would be disbanded right away. You know, like we lock people up for that and throw away the key. Those that sexual, that are sexual predators and the monsters to hide those folks is crazy. I know I'm offending a lot of people right now, but that light needs to be shown, you know, directly at the corruptness inside of all organizations and institutions that are hiding predators, period. So as people are starting to say, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I don't know what to do, but that doesn't feel right. We're left with a vacuum. And that vacuum is, what are the practices? Do we pray? Do we not pray? Was that all a lie? Because there was a lot of lies going on. What do we do? And so I'm not suggesting that the practices of performance psychology would you know, supplant best practices of religion, but I am saying that there is, a, there is a moment for us to capture to say, what are the traditions of your family? Can you anchor them, just like a great coach, to some ancient traditions 
that have stood the test of time, that feel right to the way that you think about yourself and the relationships you want to have with other people in your future? And are there some practices for modern science that make sense? Meditation is a great one. It does not need to be spiritual by any means. It can be deeply. But meditating with your family is an awesome way um, to have a set of practices. So, and that's like science is suggesting about eight minutes. You start to get some really interesting stuff happening at the brain, uh, behaviorally, psychologically. So, you know, eight minutes a day is an interesting kind of way to think about it. But um, in my family, we, my son, like he's 15, he's just kind of early into sport right now. And uh, he sets three goals before every practice and he writes them down or puts them in his phone. And then um, I ask him to share them with me and I ask him to share it with his coach to make sure that like it's all lined up. Sometimes he does with his coach, sometimes he does with me, you know, but it's more yes than not. And those goals uh, for anyone listening, like what would they write down? Three things that are 100% under their control that will help them get better at the things that the coaches have said or they know they want to get better at. So it's three goals that are 100% in their control. And why that's so interesting is that it's like, I don't know, six or eight words per goal. Like maybe it's like fast feet, but it, but fast feet laddering up to a skill they want to get better at is cool. But what you're actually doing is putting them in a position of power. You're saying when you work on this thing that's wholly under your control, that you are in a position of power to influence your arc of growth, your whatever. And so that's why controllable goals are so important is it puts the person in power, uh, in control of them uh, where they apply their energy. So those are small little practices that I think, you know, show pay dividends for later. We could just cut the interview right here. Everyone, you just, that yeah. was just like gold. And I know you were thinking about Caroline because, uh, you know. Well, you know what I was thinking about is, you know, we have, I think I'm sure Kelly's told you a water, our daughter plays water polo. And yeah. I do, I mean, the goal setting, I think is critical. And, and then I also think also finishing a practice and reflecting a little bit on what you learned or didn't learn, you know, with respect to those goals, I think sort of circling back on those. But what I was thinking as you were saying that is what would her coaches, how would her coaches receive, you know, a text with like, these are my goals for this practice or right. Like, you know, because yeah. it's I'd not be blown away as a coach that I have a kid, yeah. a young person yeah. who is sort of thinking in and has some att- intention yeah. for intentional practice, not just junk practice. Like that's incredible. Yeah. And it would be yeah, interesting. I love I it. Sitting with just, just yesterday I was sitting with a, um, he coached over three Olympic games in volleyball. And, um, I said, what are some important things to you? Like things that over your radical career, you know, that are really important. He goes, you know what? And it just rattled, he rattled it off. He says, every contact matters. I go, what do you mean? He says, I I love when kids, you can see that when they show up every time that they're going to make contact with the ball and their readiness to make great contact with the ball, like it matters to them. So every contact matters. In other words, to us nerds, it's like deep focus with a clear purpose of what they're trying to do in the moment and where they can do that more often, where that might take them. And so... So I, I don't know. Some coaches don't value it. Some coaches love it. And I just think it is important, though, that the athlete, if the parent is part of the, the support uh, mechanism, which I know it is for you guys, that we're not just operating in a weird vacuum from the coach. That's not good. You know, well, it's an coaches, old model, certainly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It's, it's patriarchy model. 101. You probably saw, yeah. and we'll come back to this, but I want to get your take on this the transfer portal has just opened up in football in a really profound way. And we've seen 1200 young people basically say this dream that I broke myself for that I sharpened to ended up at this division one school, whatever school I was at, I suddenly don't want this and I'm looking for something else. For me, it hints at one is wow. Either we sold those kids a wrong dream and they, got there and it wasn't the dream that they had sort of been sold or two, we had this really potentially we've just dismantled a really gnarly control system of the NCAA and universities squashing kids who have no other agency and control. Do you have a, an opinion about that just through your lens about just the 1200 kids who are like, I want to leave my well, school and go somewhere else. Just in football, right? right in I football. mean, that's just in football. That's not all transfer portals. Yeah, that's correct. Um, 
I, I think we don't know how this is going to play out. I don't think we're really ready for it, like as parents and kids, to know how to navigate this. But I do think that the power and control of the NC2A is real. And the, the, just like in the corporate settings, in like multinationals or large corporate settings, um, the pandemic was, if nothing, there's a lot that happened from the pandemic, but when people said remote working was a thing that we were forced to do in many, not all, but many industries, it was this moment of awakening, like, what am I doing with my life? And, and why, am, why is this firm extracting the best of me? And at the cost that I don't really know myself and I don't know my kids and my marriage is struggling and what am I doing? So we're seeing the, the best. Uh, so there's an agitated state where the workforce had some power at that moment and they were saying no more. And so it was forcing the employers to respond and the best of those companies, the brightest of leadership, they were responding in a way going, okay, so yeah, me too. Wait a minute. How do we use our culture to unlock the genius and potential and the, the fire for life? How do we do that as opposed to extract the best of people? And so that is taking place right now, maybe at an NC2, a early day struggle. Um, and listen, there's a long narrative about is, should they be scholarship or not, or should they be paid or not? That's a different narrative. But what's happening for the adults in our community is that they're saying, many of us are saying, nope, we're not being taken advantage of that way anymore. Um, I want to be part of a culture that uh, is thriving. And so kids, kids are forcing that same narrative, you know, with this portal, uh, this transfer portal. So I don't know. I think that it's uh, exciting times. And I think I would take full advantage of it if I was a kid in that opportunity. And I would also weigh the cost is when you don't drop your hips and stay in the fight and know what yeah. it's like to grind you there is an upside to that and so if you if you drop your hips to run too early there's a cost to that so <laughs> this episode of the ready state podcast is brought to you by element and what have we been up to a lot lately we've been standing on the side of a pool deck i think the technical term is freezing balls yeah, I mean, last weekend I spent two days on the side of a pool deck where it was sideways raining. Yeah, atmospheric river, yep. plus watching your children compete. And look, your kids may be good, they may not be good, but you're there, and you know what makes the whole thing better? Tell me. Hot Element. Tell I have been fact. bringing a pitcher of Hot Element, like a, my big, big Yeti bottle of Hot Element, and holy moly, like, it is just like a nice tonic to my soul, because really what I want to drink is a carafe of coffee. Yeah, but we've learned that that causes other other problems. Like never sleeping yeah, again, Yeah, like right? never sleeping. It can't be that good for missing you. Missing the entire game because you're in some gross <laughs> high right. school the bathroom. Element, I cannot stress enough that a hot lemon-lime element has changed my relationship with watching my children's sports outdoors. If you're going to stand while around you're outdoors freezing. while you're freezing, it is so good. I watch people just like freezing, and I'm. it's like a sunshine in my belly. It's so good. We cannot recommend hot element enough. We drink it every day. Look, right now, if you want to order through our link, you can get a free sample pack with all the Element flavors. Go to drinkelement.com slash TRS. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Momentus. One of the things that you are not good at is fueling... Let's hear it. <laughs> the one thing you're not good at <laughs> is fueling before training in the morning. You don't like to have a big, like... Denver omelet in your stomach no, and then do handstands. Not at all, especially not if I'm doing a more CrossFit style workout. I'm really comfortable not eating or just having a cappuccino or something beforehand. And in fact, if I do eat, I don't feel good during yeah. the workout. Now, the one difference is if I am going to go for a two or three hour mountain bike ride, I actually get up in, with enough time to eat like almost an hour, 90 minutes before the workout. But just on my day to day training, I do not love no, to eat. Full disclosure, you are not a 20 year old woman. No. And you, I am not a professional athlete. Right. But what you figured out is I really do want to try to make sure that I'm not doing anything that potentially burns my, my lean muscle mass to fuel my exercise, a.k.a. how are you keeping muscle on or protecting that? What's your new strategy? 
So I use a momentous product called Vital Aminos, oh. and I it, it is what my nutrition friend, Kyla Chanel, recommended that I do in lieu of eating. Now, of course, she said eating some actual food would be ideal, but I found that if I have these Vital Aminos before I work out, I actually feel great during my workout. And these are essential aminos that, cr that cover the whole thing. This isn't just branch chain because you're fed. This is you're covering the whole gamut so that you're needing, your body's getting what it needs. Yeah, and in addition um, to the all of the awesomeness from the Vital Aminos, I'm drinking it with a huge amount of water, which yeah. is also different because before I would just drink a cappuccino and then go work out. I <laughs> asked Momentus to make these Aminos for a long time for these reasons, right? We have vegetarian friends, we have vegan friends, we have people who don't like to eat in the morning. It's easy to add in. And in my experience with Aminos in the past is that they don't taste good. These are delicious. They're delicious. And I literally drink them every morning before I work out, and it's really been a game Because I come out and make coffee, and I'm like, there's the amino acid. Always there. Detritus. Always there. All right, so check this out. If you want to uh, get some of these yourself, go to livemomentous.com slash TRS, and use code TRS for 20% off your first purchase. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is interesting because when I first read it, I did default into my Generation X mindset <laughs> of like, yeah. come Drink on, the man, hose, kids. just suck it up and like deal with what this all, you know, I mean, I did default into that before I had to like check myself a little bit and be like, okay, what's mm -hmm. what's really going on here? But, you know, my, right. my first reaction when I read that headline was like a very Generation X reaction. It made me think. <laughs> Look at the schools who aren't seeing a lot of kids going. I wonder what's going on in those cultures. That's yeah. what made me think. I was like, wow, you've just lost your best athletes. I wonder if there's a moment of reflection for some of those organizations. Well, hopefully. I mean, that would Ooh. be, right? I mean, institutionalism and I imagine, in sport is real. Yeah, it's a I imagine real thing. there will be in some and not in others, right? Well, so, you know, um, back to the skills that we were talking about earlier, I think when many people think about, um, you know, reaching out to or consulting with a sports psychologist, it's often around an athlete, whether that's an adult or youth athlete who is really struggling with, you know, performance anxiety or depression or like real problems that are, you know, stopping them from being able to perform at their best in whatever it is they're doing. And, um, you know, is the strategy with folks in that position to double down on these basic skills? Is it more complicated than that? Like, and, and I realize that this is trying to generalize human beings, which are very complicated. So I, I'm not, that's not lost on me, but I think when many people think of sports psychology, they only think of consulting with someone like that when they're sort of like under duress versus someone who actually may be doing quite well, but might just be able to sort of make a few little tweaks in some of their, you know, practices and skills and mindset that might make them even better. Um, I don't even know if I asked a question in there. Well, yeah, no, it's super thoughtful because let's 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 kind of step back for a moment and think. Let's create a scenario where let's do let's do a coach. Okay, um, do you want to do coach's perspective or parents' perspective? Which one are you guys more interested in? Same, same. <laughs> I think <laughs> Kelly's like yeah. I am one in the let's, same. Let's go. Let's go, coach. Right now. Yeah, let's Just go, do... coach. Yeah, coach. Okay, so if um, if a coach knew what I knew after studying this mm. stuff for the last you know twenty some years. And let's say the coach is a youth coach, club or high school or whatever. Every practice, practice is what, 45 to 90 minutes to two hours, somewhere in there, depending on the level. Um, and some practices are obviously like three hours, four hours. But um, every practice would have dedicated time for technical skills, physical skills development, and mental skill development. And so the teaching of the skills is not complex at all. It's actually quite simple and concrete. And so like every, every practice would have some mechanism of a mental skill. So it's, it's as simple as, as like, um, let's say I'm the coach and I say, all right, everyone, um, get your foam roller out that you've, you know, that you've learned from ready state, get your, get, get, we're going to get your body rolling. Da, 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 da. Okay, good. And, um, as we're doing this, I'm just going to go around the room, make sure that everyone has, or go around the, the, the circle here, make sure everyone has at least three goals for today. Joey, you're up. And then they say it. And if they can't say it, it's kind of like, all right, now it's a teaching moment. So it's cool. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is that, um, let's say right after you've got them activated 
or right, let's do right after practice. This is an easy one. When I was working early days, preparing athletes to go into the UFC, one of the things that we would do is post practice, every practice, we would te we taught the skill of imagery at some point in their training camp. Post practice, we'd have a, you know those little hand towels to wipe off sweat. Um, we'd ask them, the athletes to throw it over or the fighters to throw it over their face, and one that's like a weird way to feel like a little light suffocation, you know, not really because it's just a towel, and that would be a signal to the rest of the room that I'm doing my mental imagery, I'm doing my inner work. And so they would see themselves, we do an 85-15 split, 85% of the time, whatever the shot clock was to do imagery, maybe it's three minutes, maybe there was no shot clock, it was just on your own, it was the end of practice. 85% um, of the time, see yourself being a badass, 15% of your time, see yourself and feel yourself in a compromised situation and, and slow it down and see how you work your way through it. So, so it's like post-practice is a great way to get imagery in. Um, another very concrete way to think about it is every athlete would know what their ideal competitive mindset is. And so we call it ICM. So pre-practice, every athlete would go around in the circle while they're warming up and they're doing whatever is um, uh, my ICM is, or the, the, the athlete doesn't need to say ICM, but it's about being, and then they would say smooth and slanky. It's about being an assassin. Watch the fuck out about and so you're just going around the room and they're talking about out loud what their icm is if if an athlete doesn't know what their ideal competitive mindset is if they don't know what their bullseye is what are they doing honestly what, what if you don't know what your ideal mindset is when you're warming up you're paying attention to noise as opposed to getting to the signal but most coaches don't take the time you know pre-season if you will to say okay everyone i want to be very clear when you're warming up physically, we're going to get your muscles loose. We're going to get your cardiovascular system going. We're going to get your joints mobilized. Like we're going to activate your system. And of course, we're going to activate your mind. Now, now, what are we activating it toward? And, you know, Juliet, if you're like, I don't know, what is your ideal mindset for competition? Like when you're out doing your thing and it's on, what is your ICM? I mean, this is kind of embarrassing to say, but it's like, I will win. Okay, so sort of like what I initially think of Terminator. Like, yeah, like Terminator. Yeah. Terminator Great. mindset. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so there's no right and wrong here, right? It's yours and that's your target. So now you have to speak to yourself and move in ways pre pre game, pre practice to activate that. And it's a common notion notice, notice that I did an embodied thing. The way that you move and the way that you speak, it's embodied. It's not separate. And then the idea is you're turning that on. So you're familiar on how to reach that terminator state. And then you practice which, how you want to show up on game day. And so, you know, we all know that people practice kind of one way and then lights turn on and they get nervous. It's, it's like, come on, we could do so much better. It's like the reason <laughs> right. we're nervous is because we have a pressing guess. Hope. Right. Yeah, we haven't right. actually hope practiced. is not a good right, plan. Right. Yeah. Right. Hope is not no. a good plan. That's yeah. exactly it. <clears throat> yeah. So it's doing this, business as usual, right? That's and right. so and so like that that why would is you how, why would you be ready for to be a stone cold superstar, handle the pressure, get into flow state if you haven't rehearsed that and made it as, you know, repeatable as you possible? How do you get to that moment? I think you said um pre-game ritual as an idea. Routine, you know, as routine. Pre-game routine. This is the first. Yeah, I, it's not like my hat is inside out and my <laughs> sock is. You know, it's you know I do this, then I do this, and then I do this, and my brain knows what comes next, right? I mean, I think sometimes we talk about that in terms of sleep, trying to get people to chill out. Like yeah. we do this, then we do this, and then you go to sleep, and your brain is like, I know what comes next in this this step series. Exactly. exactly. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, then, I I just want to say really fast how. Um, I think even though I know this, hearing it so simply and clearly explained, this idea mm -hmm. of incorporating, you know, we do all this physical tune up and we warm up and it is such a missing piece. I mean, it's so obvious when you say it, and it's so important, yeah. but it is so interesting to hear. I'm just like, man, you know, we just, it's really so few coaches are thinking this way and implementing this. It's so really interesting. 
so it, this was, I'm going to go back. Um, I think it was probably 20 years ago. I wrote a whole curriculum for the beginnings of what was the very beginnings of sports performance coaches. I wrote a whole curriculum, how to deliver mental skills training um, on the platform, on, on turf, you know, not for game day, but how to deliver mental skills training when they're in that controlled environment of practice, um, not technical practice, but sports performance stuff. And I've been asked to dust it off a few times, but it just, it, well, it just, I haven't found the right business partners to like <laughs> turn that into a curriculum, to turn that into a, you know, a vertical that not only changes lives, but, you know, makes money. So I just haven't found the right thing, but it, again, it's not, it's not complex. It's quite simple. And at the same time, uh, humans are complex. So that's the other side of sports psychology. And if we just kind of pause the analogies and, or the, the examples of how to fold it in to, um, to practice, and we move over to the complex side of the human experience, um, asking your athletes, asking your athletes' parents to articulate um, their personal philosophy. That's a real bit of work now. You know, asking the adults in the room, what is your personal philosophy? And they go, I, I don't know. What is your purpose? So we, we want the kids to know all these things, but sometimes asking the parents and the kids, you know, to train breathing training or to train goal setting or whatever is like you get this compounding effect that is awesome. But on the complex, the complexity side is like, what is your operating system? And your operating system is more about your philosophy, your purpose, the vision that you hold for yourself, knowing your strengths as um, your character strengths knowing how to navigate sticky situations. That's all part of the operating system. And that takes typically is more like what a psychologist or a mental skills coach would get into the messiness of it. But those other simple things, that's all of us can. Yeah. can kind I of really love any coach or any parent or anyone could implement those things. And I love that's that right. we sort of had the distillation of family values, experience comes into what's your operating system. And what is your pregame? What is your mindset, right? That, like, how do you get to there? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about a team I'm currently working with where there's, you know, 25 different really nuanced, personalized answers to that. You know, I think about um, Nick Gill of the All Blacks is a strength coach. There's one of our good friends. And the kids go out and do the haka. And I say kids because there are kids now. But they go out and do the haka. Compared to us, you mean? And they're so jacked up, they have to go in and calm down. And for me... That would be a sort of nightmare mindset where there's so much noise and the gain turned up. I can't be lucid because I'm being overwhelmed by like the feelings of ripping my shirt off. You know, that's, you know. Well, so that to your point is like, that's where if you think about like um, skills, it's a little bit more like having dials. And so if I want to turn up intensity, I also want to know how to turn down intensity, mm. you know? And so if I want to turn up, the, the Terminator aspect, I also need to know how to turn that down. And so you're, we're at this, at the basic level, we're giving them these skills, but they're more like dials to be able to turn it up and down. And so for, for the kids, the athletes that get jacked up for, you know, the pregame routine and then want, need to come back down, that's where we deploy a whole set of strategies, whether it's breathing or music or light stretching, just to downregulate a little bit, not too much. We're not trying to get into like a chill zone. We're trying to find something that is ideal for performance. For them, that individual. The um, individual. One of the things I love is that you sort of are this high performance kid. You discover all of this. You discover the mind, the brain. You're at uni. Somehow you end up in high performance arenas and everyone, the highest performance arenas, you are in there and talking, working alongside those coaches and staffs and athletes. But... It seems like, like something that I relate to is that you've come to use sport as a laboratory to some, somehow actually transform society where well, you're not just a one trick, Hey, I won a national, another NBA title, or, you know, Apollo has another gold medal around his neck. You really seems like the, the, the swing of your work is saying, how do we take these things we're learning in high performance? and actually transform community, transform our society. Am, am I reading that right? Because that's something that we 
feel very is very important in the work we do in high performance. We don't just leave it there. We really try to bring it back and say what's essential and how do we redeploy those things? I love that you're picking out something, picking up on something that has not been explicitly shared by me. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, sport is a way to learn more about who we are. And it's a working laboratory to understand how individuals and relationships work relative to an unknown outcome. And so I want to take best practices on um, in this artificially created. These are these are these are games that we've artificially created to do what? To put money on their table? That's not why they're created. They were created in early days, they're created to prepare people for war. Um, but that's not where sport sits in our modern society. But what I do want to help people um, understand is the brilliance on how the, the some of the most artistic athletes and performers in the world organize, fundamentally organize their life to experience flourishing and freedom and their potential. And that's the crosswalk that I've been trying to do over the last, call it 10 years, is from sport, which is my approach in sport is to meet them where they sweat. So my office was on the on the sidelines, in the bus, in the hallway, in team meeting rooms. Um, I don't want to have an, an office, you know, like that felt too much like the old model of psychology. There's a, there's a time and place to have like a sanctuary where it's really safe. Like there's, I do need to honor that that's an important part of the mechanism. But I met them where they sweat. And because I didn't want to just passively wait down the hall, you know, or, or across town, better yet. And so I also want to meet people outside of sport where they sweat. And where do we sweat now? In business. Mm -hmm. That's like, you know, that's where most people spend most of their time. So my crosswalk from sport to business has been to um, share what happens behind the velvet rope. And it's not like the training is less interesting. Like the things we just talked about are very good. And I can't wait for them to be in the rhythm of families operations and the rhythm of youth coaches operations. And one day they'll get to like better practices in, in college athletics as well. But I'm more interested in the fundamental commitments that people make to be great and sharing those best practices with them. Like um, every day athletes amongst their peers and with people that hold power to decide if they get to stay in pro sport or get put on the bench on the fast track out of the club. So amongst your peers that are trying to take your job and amongst your peers that are counting on you and with coaches that determine whether you stay or go, you have to go to the messy edge where you're not sure if you're going to fall into a thousand pieces or it's going to work out. That's what's required to get better, to get to that messy edge. And that's what athletes do, you know, every day. And the rest of us were terrified to go on stage. We're terrified to speak up in a boardroom or in a meeting room. And, you know, so like there's so much we can learn about the fundamental commitments that athletes make and how we can follow um, some of those best practices. You know, I gave a, um, I, I love this, by the way, and I gave a I'm talk. I'm so glad you can say this. I gave a talk, <laughs> I don't know, maybe five years ago or something to athletes, uh, female athletes at San Jose State University um, mm -hmm. about sort of like how to, you know, what they should do after college and how they should think about it. And I think there was a lot of concern and unrest about, you know, how they could approach the work world. And, you know, I went into the room and said, hey, you know, you guys actually have this amazing skill set that you may not even be able to vocalize or be aware that you have because you've had this sort of athletic experience in college and the discipline and the communication and the team building and whatever, you know, mental skills that they get from that. And I said, that is really no different than going out into a company and, you know, trying to perform in a company. I mean, these are really the same skills, you know, performing at your best in either environment. Um, and, you know, I think that, I think that was really surprising. You know, there wasn't this idea yes. that these skills were transferable, you know, out into the business world. We weren't, and, we weren't concrete and discreet about yeah. saying, this, this is this, yeah. right? We, we, people were left onto their own devices right. to connect the dots or not. Yeah. 
And, and so just, it, it, I think, you know, I hope it was helpful to them in realizing that they actually had a lot more in their toolkit than they realized they had as they, you know, left the sort of, you know, and I do think it's sort of a safe, comfortable environment when you're in a university as in an athletic program and you have tons of support around you and then you're just sort of, you know, set free into the world. Um, and my mission was just to say, hey, you actually have this, you know, broad range of skills that you can deploy that you've learned in this environment. And it's really very similar. I love that because some of those skills are they know how to take feedback, they know how to lead and follow, they know how to be on time, they know how to um, be ready, you know, for opportunities, they know how to invest in themselves and invest in really like, there's so much that is valued in the next phase of their life to be um, a contributing member to a team that is left unexamined in many respects. That being said, What's different between sport and business is that in sport, oftentimes purpose is given to them. Um, mission is clarified for them. Yeah. And yeah, right. they, yeah. And then the other thing is that they're not really sure. Um, the, athletes sometimes are like baby birds in a nest. It's like there is there is a lot of like, here, here's the sets and reps I want you to do today. <laughs> and it's a little bit like me going to a restaurant and the you know, the, the chef, this, a strength coach of mine said this analogy to me the other day. He says, when you go to a restaurant, do you, does the, does the chef tell you what you're going to eat or do you choose? No, I choose. And so it's like weird that we do this to young people, even adults in professional sport, like this is what you're going to do today. And the European model is different. There's a bit more agency that comes from the athletes, but in the U S model, it's like a power control model. That's a bit antiquated. Um, and so there are some things that are unsettling, you know, in the in the from to from sport to business um, that I think we can do better in preparation for sure. So we're going to take a bit of a right turn, although it's not really a right turn it's because we really want to spend time talking about your book, which just recently came out. And I want to start by saying congratulations. I think it's your first book. Thank you. It and is. yes. Um, or at least your first like formal book. I'm sure you've done a massive amount of writing in ways that probably qualified <laughs> as a book for this. But yeah. but anyway, congratulations. Um, Kelly and I both have it and loved it. Um, Thank you. Thank and you. let's just get right to it. What is, so the book is called The First Rule of Mastery. What is The First Rule of Mastery and why is it so important? So the first rule of mastery is to work from the inside out. And that's what the best of the best do. And that's what they constantly point to is how to work from the inside out. However, the subtitle of our book, it's called The First Rule of Mastery, Stop Worrying About What People Think of You. And I'll tell you how that squares between what I just said the first rule is and the subtitle is that um, I think one of the greatest constrictors of human potential is this obsessive worry we have. Are we okay in the eyes of other people? And so if I were to say to you, the first rule of health is to stop drinking poison, you go, oh, I get that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so, so we are drinking poison every day in the way that we shape our thoughts because there's this undercurrent, this real need to belong. Belonging is safety. 200,000 years ago, if we couldn't figure out how to be contributing members to the tribe and we we're actually dysfunctional to the tribe, the three of us were out quick. And the three of us, it's, it's, we don't have enough time to hunt, gather, forge, fight, defend, protect. It's, it's too dangerous in the wild by ourselves. So belonging is safety. And modern day with this ancient brain, we've got this mechanism come to find out that is constantly scanning to see if we're okay. Okay in the eyes of others. Because rejection 200,000 years ago was a near death sentence. Rejection in modern times feels like it could be a death sentence. So in response, we worry about it. We anticipate. We think a lot about what they might think of me. Then in the actual physical engagement with another person, we're constantly tuning in and checking. Do they think I'm okay? What are their micro expressions? Did they respond? Did they laugh? Am I on the way in or am I on the way out? And then the third thing that takes place is that when we feel like we might be on the way out, we do five very predictable things. And the two that I want to talk about that are interesting is we conform. So we might, we might just shape shift a little bit to, to not really be our true self. 
but be the part of us that is a please that is pleasing to the other person, just so that they're accepting us, or we'll fully contort. We will abandon our first principles, our virtues, our values, our best friends, and we will completely shape shift and abandon um, the principles that matter to us just to fit in. And so there's there's the recklessness to not addressing this primal need, which is the to for safety. And that need is primarily met in belonging. And here we are working from this filter that's happening in plain sight, right under our nose, but we don't address it. And we just had fun and we named it FOPO, the fear of people's opinions as one of the great constrictors of human potential, but one of the, the thieves of joy. And we, you know I, that I'm appropriating that, that, that insight from someone else, but this is one of the great constrictors of us becoming the best of us. And Do you think <clears throat> this this first performance anchor, this vacuum piece, this FOPO, has it always been like this? <clears throat> or is it a more recent phenomenon because of <laughs> like exacerbated by social media? Yeah. The mo just it's different. Where you, you know, you're I was thinking about a couple of our friends who are like Kaylee Humphreys, incredible, greatest Bob Sledder of all time. She was like, I was able to go to the track by myself, train by myself and disappear every day. Alex Honnold, just go into his van, climb, go back to his van. And he's like, I, she's like, I didn't have any of the responsibility this next generation does to have sponsors and put myself out and wear cute outfits and, you know, show my booty. And she's like, I was able to get a lot of work done. So clearly this is a first principle in, in terms of human organizations, safety. We talk about, do you feel safe in your organization a lot as, as we're trying to untangle people's pain, but is mm -hmm. the, 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 the analogy is I'm like, we're seeing more and more people miss hip extension. I worked it in yes. that people are missing hip extension as their modern selves. Is this sort of Kelly's the actually set up this entire conversation so that he he's can smiling because we extension. talked about it too. I know. It's his favorite. <laughs> is, <laughs> it's, it's the long con to get to hip extension. <laughs> is this a more a phenomenon that has always been there that we haven't talked about enough, or is this now something that in this day and age we can no longer ignore? Oh, I love the last framing that you added. We cannot ignore this. David Foster Wallace, one of the great writers, sets up this beautiful um, story, and he says, "There's an old fish." and two young fish swimming in, in um, and they're crossing their paths. And the old fish says to the two young fish, morning, how's the water? And the two young fish swim along, they won't say anything to each other because they're not sure how to respond. And then one of the young fish says to the other one, the hell is water? <laughs> and so the old fish is pointing, the three of us are the old fish, by the way, we are pointing, <laughs> we're pointing to this thing that is, is, it's the water that we're swimming in which is this need to belong and the eyeballs of the other person hold the answers. They hold the threat or they hold um, the opportunity to be close. And so, so yes, we could point to social media. It's, it's, it, it's convenient to point to that. This has been around for a very long time. Yeah. I was a public figure when I was on the farm growing up between the ages of three and um, nine. I was a public figure. I had my mom, my dad, my neighbors, my uncles, my aunts, my grandparents. I was public. My public sphere was small, but I had to show up. I had to be right. I had to fall in line with the culture of the family. And then I had a little bit more public. I had my 32 friends, you know, that were in the class. I had some teachers and, and, and. So, so the point is that we've always been public people. Now we've got a public that we don't know. Hmm. So that's the only difference. And here's like, this is like so agitating for me because it, it took me way too long to figure this out, is that I had to come to a place in my life where I had to make a fundamental decision that I am going to be me, independent if the lights are on or not. So why in the world would I change game day versus practice day? Because the only difference between game day and practice day are, is that more people are watching. The only difference between the Olympics and a world championship or a you know qualifier for the Olympics is that more people are watching. Why would I change me? Why would I think differently, behave differently? What am I doing? 
I'm, I've now lost control of my ability to be me. And it's kind of the only thing that I really have is to be me. And, and if I am going to be a different version of me because the external world has changed, I'm now in a weak position. And so I get whipped around by the world around me. And that happened for so much of my life that I had to make a fundamental decision and then really practice it in, in what felt like a scary way. Because if I didn't know if I was enough. I didn't know if I would show up and be me if people would say, hey, uh, why don't you pipe down a little? Or why don't you bring a little? Like, what, you know, what's up with the way that you talk? Or So um, there's a risk involved in this. So I don't think it's new, Kelly. I think that there is some fl- there's some fuel on the flame, but we have this need in our brain for survival to be okay in the eyes of others. And that's the proposition I'm pointing to. So when I was reading your book, I was thinking to myself, well, I definitely have FOPO and basically everybody Mm. I know has FOPO. And I was trying to think of someone that I knew or didn't know that doesn't have it. And the only person that came to mind was Elon Musk. And actually in his case, I was like, maybe he actually needs a little more FOPO in his life. Um, (laughs) But but, (laughs) um, is it true? Does everyone have it? Um, And And I guess the question is, how would one know if you have, I guess what I would describe as a more unhealthy version of it? Because I guess on some level as humans, we do have to in some capacity care what other people think about us. But I imagine your proposition is that it can, you know, the pendulum can swing into sort of an unhealthy range where it's controlling our choices and decisions and how we show up in the world. And am I getting that? Am I sort of explaining that right? You got it. So the subtitle is stop worrying. The subtitle is not is not stop caring. So it's not stop caring about what people think of you. That's what sociopaths, narcissists, and the truly enlightened do, right? It's it's not a not caring. It it is stop the excessive worrying. And it's that excessive worry that makes our organism exponentially more expensive to run when in the background we're playing a second game, when we are worrying about what they might think of us later, if we wear this or say that, or don't say that, what will happen? And so I think that it's really important to care about what certain people think about how you're living and conducting your life. And for me, I just need, I've got a round table with eight chairs on it. And those eight chairs are very intentional. And I've got criteria to make it to that, to that eight chairs. And, and then I've got some, some other chairs that are in the room, but they're kind of like not at the center table. And so that, those eight are the ones that I really care about. Those are the ones I turn to. And the other chairs that are in the room, you know, like I, I pay attention to them as well. And so I just have to be clear that the amount of information, or I'm sorry, the amount of checking in with others am i okay or not can get spin way out of control if i don't i don't have some sort of mechanism to know whose opinions materially matter to me and so the caring versus worrying i'm glad you brought that up i think worrying period is a problem caring with certain ones that they've demonstrated that they already care that that is materially important Do you think you could define it as like caring really hard and have it not be worrying? No, I'm just kidding. I'm a total worrier. So I'm (laughs) speaking of myself here. Um, How does one know or diagnose oneself as having a, you know, worrying style of FOPO? And what can we do? What can we do to move beyond that into a more healthy, healthy place? Okay. Um, first fun fact is I don't think you guys would have known this, but we have, we built an assessment as a little bit of a pilot to help people see where they might be on a range. Totally free. Totally. It's like a work in progress. It's definitely a working laboratory. It's not evidence-based. It's not research backed. It's my best estimate and it's a bit playful as well. Hey, there is something called clinical anecdotal empiricism where you're just N of one times many, many, many millions. So wh- <laughs> yes. wherever that is, we'll definitely link to it so people can go to it, you know, after yeah, this. Yeah, it's, it's a fun themselves. reference point. Yeah, yeah it's on fin- findingmastery.com. You can find it there. And then the other thing is I would say to, <clears throat> to be more clear is the we think about them as on-ramps and off-ramps. So on-ramps to being more FOPO, if you will, and off-ramps to get off of it. One of the, one of the really important um, 
off ramps is awareness. It's like recognize that this might be a thing for you and then maybe even talk about it with somebody. And if you don't like to talk about it, because I was embarrassed myself that I was doing it for so long, that maybe journal about it and just kind of, I think when you hear it, you just kind of know. And so awareness is really important. And then the, the second part of awareness is some sort of practice to increase your awareness, increase your awareness of how your thoughts work, how you work with your feelings and emotions, how your physiological sensations and signals to your body like work, awareness of how triggers outside of you, you know, um, present an opportunity to either slide into FOPO or work well with it. So awareness trainings come from three mechanisms, primarily mindfulness and meditation, journaling, and conversations with people of wisdom. Those are the three big. So that would be a radical off-ramp, invest in an awareness practice. The second is our culture, certainly in the West, is obsessed with performance. We rank kids right out of, you know, grade six or uh, age six onward. We're starting to give grades and rank and whatever. And, and so we're obsessed with performance, which would make it very easy to explain why so many of us have what's called a performance-based identity. So that is when your identity is not a reflection of who you are, your being, but it's a reflection of how well you do things relative to other people. So a performance-based identity is like, I am a baseball player and like it's it's quite narrow and it's related to how well you are a perform, uh, baseball player or how well you are a fill in the blank. So a performance, if you have a performance based identity, it makes perfect sense why you would have that perfect sense. There is a rich opportunity to get to move from that to an off ramp, which is from a perfor performance based identity to a purpose based identity and a purpose based identity is exactly what it sounds like. I'm defined more about who I am and what matters most to me, which is not my performance part of me, but the reason I'm here. And so all the historical greats, all of them are very clear on their purpose. And the rest of us are, you know, we're scrumming around with our performance-based identity and look at me and look how well I do something as opposed to being committed to something greater than ourselves. So performance-based identity to purpose is another kind of way to work through it. You, um, this book is, I, I pre-ordered it. I was lucky enough to get one of the early kind of readers copies all in because yeah. I just feel like some of the tools that you're bringing to the, the greater light, just bringing out underneath the table and sort of putting on the table for so many of us really should be just de facto processes, experiences of just being a person who wants to get along better with themselves and other people. It's, it's, yeah. it's sometimes I'm like, eh, it's not really high performance, Mike. It's a, uh, it's mm -hmm. like how to be a decent person who doesn't freak out. I mean, really it's that, it's that foundational and it also helps to win world championships. You put this book out. We recently just did this and I don't even know if we've had this conversation yet, but what has surprised you about what's resonated with people? Because you're basically, you know, and you're so wonderful of, of inviting people in to become curious about their process and awareness. And certainly mm -hmm. it is easier to do that when their people are in crisis, they're losing or, or, you know, they've lost their, their partners or whatever, but what has surprised you about bringing this tool set out into the world and seeing this sort of application that maybe you didn't anticipate? Uh, two, two things. I didn't, it was a surprise to me that so many people resonated with FOPO. I knew that I would never have written this as a book if the feedback from Harvard Business Re Review wasn't like you were the number one downloaded article 12 months in a row on this topic. Like, you, you, you need to write a book on this. I was totally surprised. <laughs> I thought I was doing something kind of brave and sharing this weird thing that I struggled with and that I saw a lot of pro athletes struggle with, you know, not letting people down, not wanting to look bad, not wanting to be embarrassed, not wanting to blow it. You know, that's all expressions of FOPO. And, and then 12 months later, like it, this struck a chord. So I was really surprised just that it was, I wasn't alone in it. That's one. The second is I was surprised that, um, as I've been talking about it a bunch, that people were surprised that this would be my, a, a book that I would write. I think maybe to your point, Kelly, it's like, why didn't you talk about the, the science of 
the psychology of excellence or something like that. And, or like, why didn't you talk about um, mastery in a different way and highlight how yeah. the, the, the true masters work and how you can be more masterful in your own life, something like that. So I was surprised that it was a surprise in twofold. I think that um, I'm also really surprised that um, I'm not as good as I hoped I would be by the age of 52. I'm still <laughs> working at it. <laughs> Wait, you oh, haven't, man, you haven't figured it that. all out oh, yet? Oh, man. No, I'm still. <laughs> I feel like trying. I just got to the table. I'm like, oh, whew, I made it to the table. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, so um, all of that is the case, the true case. Well, I do feel like when you're um, raising kids during a long phase of your life, maybe you don't have as much time. And, you know, we have one kid off to college and one kid that's a little older and you have some moments to be like, oh, okay, like, how's this all going? You know? Well, I really am trying to become more curious. Like, as I've turned 50, you may not have actually experienced any of this reflected in my actual behavior, but my internal <laughs> dialogue is I'm trying to be more curious <laughs> about, like, I wonder how this is going to go with Georgia. I wonder what choices he's going to make. I wonder what, you know, it was interesting to Caroline. I wonder what, you know what I mean? I just... It's a little bit, I, sometimes I'm working with young people and I'm like, if you understood how much power you have and how rad you are, you would be insufferable. And now I can say that from a 50 year old cis hetero white guy, you know, who's had some success. I'm like, you're great. Why aren't you great? Why don't you feel you're great already? And it is really sometimes I just have to say like, man, it takes time to really become a decent human and a lot of work. True fact. I think curiosity is one of the superpowers for so many of the ails that we struggle with and being curious honors another person's experience. Mm. It, it's a, it sets you in a learning frame. And I think the best coaches, like if you think about a stack masterful to low performing coaches, high performance being right underneath mastery. So mastery, high performance, performance coaches, and kind of low performing or poor or amateur coaches is that amateur coaches, will give direction and pointers or whatever, and they're kind of wrong most of the time, but they sound good. And then master master coaches, no, let me do high performance coaches. Um, what they say is really quite precise and they're asking questions, but they're also in the frame of like the expert. Masters, uh, when they're when you're in that kind of rarefied space, it's all questions. It's all curiosity. It's asking the doer, what did you feel and see? And like, what'd you unlock? And, you know, did you figure anything out? Or how about that thing we were working on before? Did it show up there? And it's all, it, it, they're a learner and they're using the opportunity to speak to people that are trying to be learners as well. And they ask questions. And so the art of curiosity is through the, the way that questions and the few statements are made. And so I love that you're on that. It's, it's, a, it's a radical commitment. Um, to other people and to yourself to learn. And so I'll, I'll, I'll maybe round, round uh, third base here with you guys is that the year of, and so it's something I do every year with my team and my family is that we don't do year end resolution or uh, new year resolutions, but we do make a public um, announcement of what we want the year to be about. And so it is like more, instead of a resolution, it's more of an intention. And so last year for me was the year of play. And I wanted to be more like a panda. I wanted to be more play. I'm su too serious. I'm too intense. Everything I do is so like evidence-based and blah, 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 blah. Like I need to be more like an animal in the wild that has no predators, right? And just kind of roll around, <laughs> eat, eat whatever I want, you know, like, like let go of some of the guardrails here, Mike. And so it was the year of play. And I do, we do it publicly um, at the team. And I do it, of course, with my family. And it's just, it's a really cool way to think about sharing the, the version of you that you want to bring into the world and to have people that want to support you in it as well. And so I wish I had a name tag, you know, with my trusted people to share with them. Like, remember, I'm trying to work on being playful so they could help hold me accountable. And the ones that remember and like really know, I know what you're working on, Mike. And they just chin check me like, is this, is this the panda, Mike? Damn it. No. I feel like, wouldn't it be hilarious if you just had like one of those, hello, my name is name tags. And then underneath it's like Panda or like Panda. Year of Play. You just year wear that all the time. You know, everyone's like, hello, my name is, you know, constant yes. reminder. I love that. I mean, I think that that's really, you know, 
such a, a cool idea and something that people listening to this can think about doing. And, yeah. you know, on that note, I'll say that I think that I had like 500 more questions and I'm sorry that we didn't get to them. So maybe one day we'll have you back to deep dive even more on this. But Look, to I, the extent I, that... Oh, yeah, Julie, I, I love your guys' vibe. I love what you stand for and how you represent um, a free part of the human experience that is highly knowledgeable and skilled and caring about other people. Like, I can't get enough of what you guys are doing. So I'm a fan. Um, I want to be a great supporter in whatever I can. So you name it. I'll show up whenever it is. And, um, and, and like, I talked way too much on this one. I want, I'd rather have a discussion with you guys, but I felt like that was not the, um, the, the agreement that I was supposed to hold up on this conversation. So <laughs> more to come, more to come. So I, for the, I, I, wait, I have oh, to yeah. say lastly that, uh, thank you so much. Every once in a while I was like, man, I wish I was the, the running guy. I wish I was, I'm the stretching guy, but I, right now I wish I was the mind brain guy. Yeah, you just go back to school for that, baby. I know, I know. And that's yeah. actually the first time in a long time where I'm like, I need to know more about this person and the way they think and the results they're getting. It's, it's been a minute before I've had yeah. this sort of profound so, curiosity. Yeah. And well, I'll just, um, I want to plug your book a little bit and say, go mm -hmm. check this book out. It's great. We're going to link to it in our show notes. Um, I think it can really change lives and change people's perspectives. So congratulations again on that. And, you know, we do have a lot of coaches in particular that listen to this podcast. I mean, we have a diverse audience of coaches and parents and, you know, who knows who, but um, for people who are looking for more and more resource, resources, where do people find you? Where, how do they yeah, learn I, more and get more info? You. Thank you both. I think that the, um, the podcast is a fun way, you know, yeah. to actually have some consistency. The, so the Finding Mastery podcast is cool. We've got some online resources on, on findingmastery.com, but it's, it's more about um, partners that we trust. Um, you know, I do write a, a fair bit on LinkedIn. So it's a little bit heavier, a little bit more thoughtful pieces on LinkedIn. On Instagram, I smile. You know, I do that pretty well, I think. <laughs> So really my the Instagram thing is nauseating and wonderful. It's a way to share some insights and clips, but like, um, I, I think the best way is probably the podcast. Awesome. Yeah. Mike, it was so fun to chat you up and I learned a ton yeah. and I can't wait to hang out with you more in person. Ditto. I feel the same way guys. So I appreciate y'all and thank you for including me in what you're, what you're building and what you've created. Thank you, my friend. All the best. Thank you for listening to the Ready State Podcast. If you like what you're hearing, check out all our episodes here or at thereadystate.com. And be sure to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes to help others find our show. Check us out and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Ready State. Until next time, cheers, everyone. You got it.